You know, it seems that every country has chosen some symbol for their country, a national symbol they feel represents them. For example, our flag. Now, what would you say is another symbol of our country? The eagle. The eagle. Yeah, the bald eagle. Israel also had a cherished symbol that represented him. Do you know what it was? The lion. <laughs> a major clue with the opening, right? Yes. <laughs> yes, the, I didn't mean the menorah. I thought maybe somebody would say the menorah, but no, it's, it's the vine, the grapevine. It's like this ancient Jewish coin here. This, uh, and uh, then in uh, Herod's temple, apparently, there were two pillars, and they were go there were gold vines going up these pillars, and people would keep adding to this vine, so it was an important symbol for them. Uh, we need to know what the Jewish people of Jesus' day knew about this symbol of the vine. I don't think we really understand it entirely. There are quite a few Old Testament references to Israel as a vineyard, a vine that God took from Egypt and planted in Palestine. But here's the strange thing about that one. Most countries choose a symbol that glorifies their country in some way. The symbol of the vine all through the Old Testament was judgment on Israel. They chose a symbol of judgment for their symbol. Like this place here, it's in Isaiah 5. God is speaking and he says, so now, residents of Jerusalem and men of Judah, please judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard than I did? When I expected a yield of good grapes, did it, why did it yield worthless grapes? That's why the dead vine over there. Now I will tell you what I'm about to do with my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it will be consumed. So God removed the protection from Israel and they were vulnerable and were conquered by Babylon and their neighboring countries were rejoicing. All the people of Israel were either killed or exiled. There was none of them left except for a few poor people, it says, left in the land. Now, Psalm 80 was written from that exile and it laments what happened to national Israel after the people had been killed or exiled. It begins when Israel began as a nation in Egypt long ago. It starts in verse 8. Here the poet says, to, speaking to God, You uprooted a vine from Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared a place for it. It took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered in its shade and the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out sprouts toward the sea and shoots towards the river. Why have you broken down its walls? So that all who pass by pick its fruit. The boar from the forest tears it and the creatures of the fields feed on it. Return, God of hosts, look down from heaven and see, take care of this vine the root your right hand has planted, the shoot you yourself made for yourself. It was cut down and burned up. They perish at the rebuke of your countenance. So then they pray this, let your hand be with the man at your right hand, with the son of man that you have made strong for yourself. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us, and we will call on your name. Restore us, Yahweh, the God of hosts. Look on us with favor, and we will be saved. Did you hear how that ended? There's a yearning for someone called the Son of Man. Apparently, it's a powerful leader. That's the leader who the Jews in Jesus' day were looking for. They needed a strong king to conquer the Romans. A Messiah is what they were looking for. And this king was called the Son of Man in Psalm 80. Do we know anyone who chose that title for himself? <laughs> yes, of course, Jesus did. So now, with that national symbol of the vine, and this coming leader, the Son of Man, in mind, let's read that first verse of chapter 15. Jesus says, 
I am the true vine, and my father is the vineyard keeper. Doesn't sound like much. But this is an explosive statement. It was enough to get Jesus killed right there. We don't really get it. It's still explosive today. Why? Well, to know why, we need to look at each word because, as usual, John is really efficient and each word is important and critical to the meaning of this. So let's look at what John is saying about Jesus. First, Jesus says, I am. Now we know that, that I am is the name of God. We've studied this before. But this is the last time in John that Jesus takes the name of God as his own name. Previously he had said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. And before Abraham was, I am, and that one about got him killed right there. I am the door, I am the good shepherd, I am the resurrection and the life, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And now he says, I am the true vine. The Jewish leaders, they knew Jesus was claiming to be God. And that was enough to get him crucified. But Jesus goes on. He doesn't leave it there. He claims to be the true vine. The means there's only one, and this is it. True means this is the real thing, not the false thing. Okay, now let's look at the word vine. You know now what this vine image stands for, right? It stands for Israel. Then Jesus says, I am the true vine. You see what he's doing? It's like someone were to say, I am the true eagle. I am the only true American. What an outrageous thing to say. I don't think even Donald Trump would dare say something like that. I don't think he'd go that far to say, I am America. But that's what Jesus is saying here. He's claiming to be the nation of Israel. I am the true nation of Israel. It's like he's dismissed the entire nation of the people in the land and replaced it with himself. He's saying, in essence, they are false Israel, and I am the one and only the true Israel. In essence, what he's saying is, I, God, have replaced Israel with myself. You can see how explosive that is. Honestly, the miracle of the New Testament is that anyone followed and trusted Jesus. Because the things he said were so outrageous. And yet thousands of people followed him. He must have been some kind of man. He was the son of man. And those who God, God had chosen recognized him as their Messiah. And still do today. So, now that we know what Jesus meant when he said, I am the true vine, we should look at the second part of the verse where Jesus continues authenticating what he's just said. He says, and my father is the vine keeper. Jesus is saying that his authority to make his claim comes from God himself. God has planted him as the true vine, the true Israel. And that means he claims that God has ordained that the false Israel has been replaced. Jesus is now God's true vine, the true Israel. <laughs> is it any wonder they killed him? This has enormous implications even today. And it had tragic consequences through history because of terrible misunderstanding of biblical interpretation. Through the centuries, Christians have persecuted Jews. They called Jews Jesus killers. This horrible misunderstanding culminated, as we know, in the Holocaust of World War II. Yet, 
Jesus and all the writers of the New Testament certainly never had anything like that in mind. It never entered their head that Christians, followers of Jesus, would persecute Jews. Instead, Paul said he was even willing to sacrifice his own place in heaven and at the side of God if he could save the Jews. That's a Christian's response to the Jews. So how are we supposed to understand this verse? If Jesus is Israel, then who and, and what is that nation over there on the Mediterranean calling itself Israel? What should our response be to Jesus' claim and the teachings of the Old Testament regarding the Jewish people and all those prophecies, those promises to Israel? What do we make of all that? if Jesus is the true Israel. The nation of Israel does exist today, obviously. It's a tiny, tiny little country. It's our closest ally in the Middle East and the closest thing over there, the closest nation over there to a democratic government. Our nation is correct to protect this tiny country. It's surrounded by its enemies who have sworn to destroy it. The United States and Europe are a hedge around this little country. And of course we have their back even if we don't agree with all their policies regarding Palestinians and whatever. But here's what I think, and I think this is in the New Testament as well. I, I don't think that nation is the Israel of the Old Testament prophecies or even the New Testament. How can I say that? Well, it's kind of obvious when you think about it. There's no king there. There's no great king. There's no Jewish temple. There are a lot of people there who are citizens of Israel who aren't even religious. It's basically a secular, democratic country. And you remember, Jesus did tell Pilate that his kingdom, the Messiah's kingdom, is not of this world. Yet, because of misunderstood biblical interpretation from, well, it started in the 19th century and came into the early 20th century, up to uh, after World War II, and these misplaced religious commitments Christian Zionists have helped unleash massive injustices over there in modern national Israel. Now, here's an important comment by one of my commentators, Gary Birch. We may not like hearing all this because it's kind of counter to what we hear on, I don't know what, fundamentalist radio or whatever. Here's what Gary Birch says, and he's an evangelical conservative commentator. He says... Today, Palestinian pastors plead with Western evangelicals to recognize them as brothers and sisters in Christ and to see that because of Israel's territorial religion, their people are suffering by losing land and becoming refugees and being imprisoned. We really have to look at this square on. What are you supporting if you're supporting Israel as a Christian Zionist. A Christian Zionist, of course, is someone who believes that God has ordained that country as the biblical Old Testament Israel. And here's something else we need to look at square. Modern Israel was founded to provide a home for only one race of people. It's a racist country. If it was any other country, I'm not so sure we would be so quick to, or comfortable at least, to support them as we do. Of course, we want to support them because they're a tiny country surrounded by their enemies. But I think we ought to be a bit uncomfortable about it. People who aren't true Jews aren't granted full citizenship in Israel. So what does the New Testament teach about the Jewish people and these promises to Israel from the Old Testament? What does the New Testament tell us about this? 
Well, it takes us back to Jesus' claim to be the true Israel. You see, Israel was created to spread knowledge and love of God throughout the world. They didn't do it. They kept it to themselves. So God is doing it by himself with his own strong arm named Jesus. Now, since Jesus is the true vine, his mission is the same, and he is spreading the love of God throughout the world, through all the people of the earth, including the Jews. Some have thought that Christians and the church replaced Israel. But no, that's not from the Bible. The church did not replace Israel. Jesus, John says Jesus is the true vine. Paul says Christians have not replaced Israel, but through Jesus we Gentiles have been grafted into Israel, into that vine. That is, we've been grafted into Jesus, the true Israel. So all of God's promises, all those Old Testament promises to Israel have come together in Jesus, the Jewish Messiah. So we simply cannot allow ourselves to forget that Jesus is Jewish. What the Christians who persecuted Jews didn't understand is that in Christ we are brothers and sisters with the Jews. We're built on the same foundations of faith, the same God we worship. When a Jewish person comes to believe in the Messiah, they have come home to true Israel. Paul even said there's two Israels. There's two kinds of Israelites, one false and one true, and the true ones are ones who come to recognize their Messiah. Paul says that. He also said in Romans 11:15, for if Israel's rejection of Messiah Jesus brings reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? So for the authors of the New Testament, then, a true Jew and a true Christian are the same thing. So as Paul continues to say, we all must remain in the true vine of Israel, Jesus Christ. So our response to this nation of Israel that we see today, the national Israel, what should our response be? And what should our response be to Jews that we meet? It should be the same as we respond to anyone we meet that has interest in Christ. We should say, we were lost, but now we're found. God has chosen us to live in the promises of God, to live in his love. Say to the Jews and to everyone else, accept your Messiah, the Son of Man, the great King who was promised, the great Son of Man, the true vine. Yes, Jesus, if you've noticed, he spiritualizes the kingdom of God. It's no longer a land over there on the other side of the Mediterranean. Jesus changed that definition. It's not about land. Jesus brings his heavenly, eternal kingdom into our hearts. It's a spiritual kingdom, and that's what they didn't understand. And they still don't. It's a spiritual kingdom. As Paul says in Romans 10, 13 to 15, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But there's a, there's a problem with that, you see. How can they call on him if they haven't believed in him? And how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher telling them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who announce the gospel of good news. For that reason, God has been calling Messianic Jews to Israel. He's been calling them to national Israel. They emigrate from the United States and all over the world 
to become citizens of Israel. Israel isn't real happy to grant Messianic Jews, who are Christians, you know, that's what a Messianic Jew means, they're a Christian, who, Christian Jew who believes in the Messiah, right? Messianic Jews. They aren't excited about giving them the full citizenship, we just learned this, because they're not considered truly Jewish if they believe Jesus is the Messiah. So they have to be a bit careful. But God wants to save his people. Why do these people still go? Because God has not rejected his people. Paul yells this. He says, absolutely not. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. By their stumbling, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel jealous. Now if their stumbling brings riches for the world and their failure... Riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full number bring? It'll mean life from the dead, Paul says. Through the true vine Messiah, Jesus himself, God. Just as he promised the Jews in the Old Testament, so he is doing. We see it in the second chapter of Acts, after Jesus rose from the dead, you remember? Rose into heaven. And pre Paul was preaching to the people, all these people who had witnessed Jesus' crucifixion and probably even witnessed people coming out of their graves. It said a whole bunch of them came and were walking around Jerusalem. These same people Peter is preaching to, and he says, Repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Christ Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. For the promise is for you, and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And in many other words, he testified and urgently, strongly urged them, saying, be saved from this corrupt generation. Be saved from this false Israel that will be judged. And they were judged in 70 AD. Those who accepted his message were baptized. And how many were there? These Jews who had been implicated in the crucifixion of Jesus. How many were saved that day? 3,000. They knew what they'd seen. So even though they were implicated in the crucifixion of Jesus, they're forgiven just as we are forgiven. And Paul wraps it up in Romans eleven thirty-three to 36. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments, untraceable his ways. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? I mean, who has ever first given to him that he should be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Now you know what the true vine means.